are now recording and the screen is yours. Great, thanks Eli. Happy to be here, everybody. I'll give you a quick outline of what I'm talking about today. Um, CWD in general um, is the topic, but first I'm gonna go over a CWD overview, kind of get everybody on the same page, um, which helps with some of the explanation of the research and management implications that I'll talk about as we move along. And there's kind of four sections of overview and then some of the management around some of the research we're doing, CWD detection, ecological impact, and human dimensions. And I'll have a natural break in between each of those. People have questions at that time. So jumping right into chronic wasting disease overview, it is a progressive and fatal neurodegenerative disease of cervids. Very important to this is that it's not caused by a virus or a bacteria, which uh, makes it pretty unique in the disease world in general and the disease world in wildlife, but it's caused by a misfolded prion protein. And it impacts those members of the cervid family like caribou, deer, elk, and moose. Um, we see these pictures on the left. Uh, for example, this healthy looking mo bull moose on, on the left and the sickly looking bull moose on the right. People think about chronic wasting disease and they think about those sick animals, those skinny wasting away animals. But it's important to know that many of the animals that we find positive look like the bull moose on the left and that uh, alert doe on the left. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Chronic wasting disease was first identified in Colorado in the 1960s. And this map that we have here shows that kind of epicenter in those dark gray um, squares in, in Colorado. And this map is built by USGS and it's updated continually. And so we can see since the 1960s that chronic wasting disease detections have spread across North America quite rapidly and really ultimately in the last 20 years it has spread the furthest. So chronic wasting disease is part of a group of diseases, a family of diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, a mouthful, but ultimately means transmissible and spread from animal to animal spongiform, it's kind of the, the base word sponge and we'll see what that looks like and why it's in the name. And then encephalopathy is part of the brain. But it belongs to this group of diseases that includes other diseases, such as scrapie and sheep, BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease in cattle, and not just animal diseases, but human diseases, such as creutzfeldt jakob disease. And they all involve prions. It's kind of the base level um, of why these are part of the same family. So maybe one of the hardest parts about chronic wasting disease and prion diseases in general is what the heck is a prion, right? It's, so it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, but what is it? Importantly, uh, to understand that all mammals have normal prion proteins in their bodies. I have them, you have them, the deer walking around outside all have these normal prion proteins in their body and they, they have normal cellular function. Uh, we're still learning about what they really do in the body, but we know that they're important for copper and metal processing. And they're particularly important in nerve cells and that plays into the pathogenesis of the disease. On the right, there's a ribbon diagram of what we as scientists think this prion protein looks like. And below that, I have a picture of a slinky. Kind of weird that I have a picture of a slinky, right? Um, but we'll talk about why there's a picture of a slinky in the next slide. So we think about prions and I said that that's a normal part of our body. But when we hear the, hear the word prion, a lot of times we think about the CWD prion or the pathogenic form of the prion. See, I got muted. <laughs> Unmuted myself. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, no, uh, Mark. That was my fault. <laughs> no worries. I don't know where I left off, but I, I'll just. <laughs> it was just a couple seconds. Okay. So those, those pathogenic uh, CWD prions are a misfolded version of that normal prion in our body. And that shape can change and vary. And as they misfold, they stick together and form these tangles that we kind of see on that ribbon diagram on the right that 
that uh, tangle, that misfolded version of this prion is very resistant to destruction. And understanding this is where we come in with the slinkies. I can't take credit for this idea, but it helps us understand the um, three-dimensional structure of a prion. So in my left hand is this normal slinky. It has a three-dimensional structure. It has a function. If we were in person, I could have it walk down the stairs. In my right hand is the same slinky. It's made up of the exact same thing, but it is now misfolded. It's now a mess and it now doesn't have the same function. So we think about this um, from inside the body as these normal slinkies turn into these misfolded slinkies. It's now a totally different creature. And importantly, the uh, resistance to destruction is also in the body. So as we'll see, I move on, that these misfolded prions continually build up in the body. The body can't break them down. Normally, our bodies will break down the normal proteins in our body. They'll break them down, use those to build new proteins. The body can't break down these misfolded proteins. And that's what leads to disease, ultimately spreading through the lymph system and the nervous system, accumulating in the brain. We see in this picture in the middle, um, normal brain tissue on top. And on the picture below is a CWB positive pic, uh, picture of brain tissue. And this is where the spongiform name comes in. You can see it looks like a sponge. There's holes in there. That's where the neurons have died. Those brain cells have died because of the accumulation of these prions. And it's really a domino effect as this misfolded prion comes into contact with this normal prion. This normal prion will turn into another misfolded prion and so, so on and so forth until it reaches the brain and the animal ultimately dies. So how is that transmitted being a transmissible form of a disease? Those misfolded prions are shed throughout the time that this animal is infected. And I said earlier that a lot of the times these positive animals look like these normal deer in this picture. But during that whole process, which can from time of infection to the time of death can take up to 18 months to two years. That whole time they're shedding those prions in their saliva, blood, urine, feces, and carcasses when they ultimately die. Transmission happens direct contact, animal to animal. We know deer are very social animals, breeding season and so forth, but also indirect contact where the animal will deposit those into the environment, another animal will pick them up. So that's a quick overview of CWD and prions. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point, just about the general idea of chronic wasting disease and prions. Mark, that timing was funny. I, I had just started typing. Feel free to type questions in the chat anytime. <laughs> and, uh, and you went to your question slide. So nicely done. Um, I'll, I'll pause for just a moment as uh, folks, in case folks want to type any questions into the Zoom chat, and we can take those uh, questions as we go. Um, uh, Mark, I love the slinky. Uh, we don't get a lot of props on webinars. And I, <laughs> that, that was great. That, that was a really good uh, way to describe it and, and helpful, at least to me, to understand what's going on with the prions. Yeah, one um, of my colleagues came up with it, and I think it's just an ingenious way to understand that three-dimensional. Yeah, aspect. that's great. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing any questions right now, so I think you're uh, safe to move along. All right, I'm going to move on and happy to answer questions as we go. So understanding some of that base knowledge in, of prions and CWD will help explain some of the research that we are doing at MinPro. And the first is CWD detection. A big piece in the advancement of CWD detection is technology called RT-Quick. Uh, short for real-time quaking induced conversion. And if you know anything about RTQ-PCR, essentially the idea is the same for prion proteins. And I'll kind of explain why that is. But it takes advantage of that natural prion replication, that domino effect of starting with a misfolded prion and making more of them. Um, and right now this is a, a laboratory-based testing that is used for research, um, but is currently being validated by the USDA for official diagnosis. So what is RT-Quick? Well, it's highly sensitive and powerful, 
more sensitive than the current uh, ELISA and IHC testing that is used, used to detect chronic wasting disease. And it also is able to be used for not just dead animals, which many of the CWD um, testing now is on post-mortem dead animal tests, but it also can be used on live animals and environmental samples. So there's protocols for different tissues, for blood, feces, and then some of those environmental aspects that we want to look at in the uh, ecology of CWD, water, plants, and soil. Importantly, you can also work pretty well on suboptimal samples where the current diag diagnostics um, have limitations when it comes to autolyzed tissue, RT Quick can handle that. So what it does, and I'll explain this a little bit, it, like I said, it's like a PCR test for prions. We start with a well, think of, think of a well, and this is in, in block one here, where we have a prion substrate. We have a protein substrate, essentially normal prions. We add our sample. If that sample has misfolded prions, if it's a positive C of E sample, it starts this reaction. And in the process, that well shakes and it heats. And through that natural progression, those, that substrate, those normal proteins start adding to that infectious seed. And when that shakes, it breaks those up and we have essentially more surface area for those, those fibrils to form for that crystal um, essentially to grow. And that repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. So if we started with a positive infectious seed, we keep growing those misfolded slinkies essentially until we have measurable growth uh, at the right. The real time part of that is we can measure this as this is happening. There's a um, substance in that well called thioflavin T that binds to those misfolded prions. And through fluorescence, we can measure the growth of those prions over time. So we see that S curve here, that red S curve, that is a positive sample. We see that growth happen and it crosses a threshold where um, that blue line on the bottom does not cross the threshold. We would call that a negative. But it's also semi-quantitative in that if that S-curve quickly moves up, we know we probably had a hotter positive sample versus if it just crosses the threshold, it probably was a weaker sample that we put in. So on top of RT-QUIC, and right now for a lot of the research we're doing, we're using RT-QUIC. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, moving forward. But additionally, we are working on other novel CBD diagnostic tools essentially to increase that sensitivity, that accuracy and the speed of testing. There's a few areas that we're working on now, including microfluidics, some nanotechnology and antibody engineering that also have utility for both live and dead animals. There's potential in the future for hunter level or pen side field test, but we're still years away from that. But ultimately we see some of the things that we're working on and can, we can envision that happening in the coming years. One example of that is um, something we call MinQuick, related to RT-QUIC. Um, we based it in, in Minnesota, but it's based off of the same technology I explained with RT-QUIC. But it's a little more simple. Um, and one piece of that is that we have a nanoparticle interaction and we have a visual cue at the end. So not just a readout on a computer, but you can visually see that a positive sample is a red color and a negative sample is a purple color. But along with that, we can take light absorbance readings because those colors are different, the absorbance is different, and we can clearly see that positives read out different than negatives. And so at this point, we, you know, some of these discoveries in, with MinQuick have been made really in the last year, and we're currently working on refining this assay and validating it. So management implications of this area of research, CWD detection, also ultimately faster, more accurate CWD results for hunters and managers. Um, it's important for post-mortem and anti-mortem sampling. So whether it's hunter submissions or if managers are trying to relocate animals or stocking efforts, we can do some of those live animal testing before those animals move. Eventually we have this potential for this animal side testing and ultimately, I think we will get there. 
but also, also identification of COPD earlier in the population is important for management. So we can nip it in the bud. If we find early detections, the, those natural resource managers can have a better chance of getting ahead of that disease and reducing the spread and reducing that environmental contamination. Be happy to take any questions on our CWD detection research. Mark and I were talking earlier, and he said, "You know, I really prefer a conversation over a uh, over a, uh, just a presentation." And we switched. You may have noticed a couple of webinars ago, maybe just our last webinar, we switched from the webinar format on Zoom to the meeting format. That gives you actually the ability to unmute yourself. And I guess I would say we have a smaller group today than we sometimes do. Um, feel free if you want to unmute. This is a, a, a topic that I know is of interest to a lot of folks. And, and uh, uh, feel free to do that if you would like during a Q&A period. And I'd also be happy to get through the other sections and just have a general conversation about all of it at the end, too. Yep. Either way. All right, Mark, not seeing anything right now, so you can proceed. So the next research topic that we're working on that I'm going to discuss is that ecological impact. What does it mean? What does CWD mean for the environment and how does that play into management and our research? Environmental contamination, I talked about that indirect transmission where um, positive animals are depositing those prions into the environment, whether it's through feces, urine, or when they die, they're ultimately creating a hotspot of prions. Um, those infected deer can spread that throughout the environment and then be further spread by scavengers. So if the carcass, you know, the animal dies, the carcass is there, scavengers are gonna be pulling those pieces out in the environment, but also water movement and ultimately people. We're probably the worst at moving uh, chronic wasting disease around and that's just the natural way of things. But managing that spread is crucial because those infectious prions remain infectious for years in the soil and also in the vegetation. We're gonna look, first thing we're gonna look at is CWD and soils. There's been, with, of all the environmental aspects, there's probably been the most uh, investigation on soils and we're continuing to learn how those CWD prions interact with soils. Um, one thing that we understand, and any soil scientists understand this, that soil is a complicated matrix. Soil at area A is not the same as area B and so forth. And so because of that, um, the prion interaction is different at different sites because of organic makeup, because of um, the amount of clay and some of these research we can see pH matters. The aspect of those soils makes a difference for CWD prions, and there's continuing research on that. But uh, not only does it you know, affect how the prions are in that soil, it affects the transmission, it affects the detectability of those prions in those soils. And along with that, you know, there's always the idea of, well, what do we do about it? There's a lot of research that is continuing for potential treatments. Can we put something in the soil to get rid of those prions or bind those prions? And there are a few examples there on the bottom of things that have been looked at and that continue to be researched. Next aspect is plants. This is kind of a crazy thing um, that a lot of people don't think about, but uh, early research has shown that plants can uptake those misfolded prions. So if those prions are in the soil, in that growing medium, plants will take those misfolded prions up into their leaves and into their stems. Uh, this, this research here on the, that I'm referencing also showed that ultimately when that plant was administered to hamsters, so these hamsters are cervidized hamsters, some of their um, prion proteins are changed to be more like deer. When they're given this plant that has taken up that prion protein, they develop a neurodegenerative disease. Again, that's very early research. We're still understanding what plants take up prions. How, does, how far do they take them up? How does that matter um, when it comes to real world ecology and environments? We do know that there's um, 
another colleague who's been working on this for almost a decade. There's a manuscript that's been submitted and will ultimately be published shortly that shows multiple species um, taking up these prions, multiple plant species, including multiple commodities and also transmission to animals. So it's kind of an early area in general um, of research, but it's uh, one of my colleagues likes to call it the sleeping giant because this could be huge when it comes to movement and transmission of CWD. And speaking of movement of CWD, how does water move CWD? This is an area that we are actively working on. We just received a chunk of money from the state to look at how water can move prions. And we, we have a hydrologist on our team who thinks about this in the way, how does water move other particles? Um, and it's similar, it's very similar. What, is, what does the prion bind to? Is it, if it's binding to clay, how is water moving those, those clay particles along with the prion? So there's been a little bit of research in, in the world about this. Um, we know that it can survive in water. It can still be infectious in water. This study on top here from Nichols at all was kind of interesting. They looked at water runoff from a CWD positive area, wild deer area in Colorado, and they were able to collect that runoff in the spring and detect those CWD prions in that runoff. Again, What's in the water makes a difference. So the more organic material in there, the longer the prions remain infectious, kind of like soil. What, what's in that water makes a difference for those CBD prions. So this is the project that we have about hydrology of CBD in Minnesota. Really, there's no data out there about that. The land of 10,000 lakes and lots of rivers and all kinds of different water movement. Right now, um, chronic wasting disease is most prevalent in Southeast Minnesota, but Southeast Minnesota is a lot different than North Central Minnesota. So how do those different ecologies make a difference when it comes to water? What is the distance that it can be moved in these different areas? Um, what about water wells and treatment plants? So there's a lot of things that, that are questions right now that we need to investigate. And this, re this leads to um, a project that we kind of were thrown into earlier this year in Beltrami County. I'll give you a quick background on it and how we got to be part of it. Essentially in April, there was a deer that was tested and a Beltrami cervid farm that was CWD positive. And through that investigation, they discovered there was a carcass dump site uh, that was part of this farm. Ultimately, that dump site was on county property, about a mile from the farm. And so the DNR got involved and the state authorities got involved. And they asked us if we wanted to do environmental research there as a perfect opportunity, a really crappy situation, but a perfect opportunity for some of this research. So in May, we went there, secured remains from this dump site and see a picture on the left. Um, you know, that's what we would find in the woods is just bones remaining talked about scavengers moving things around this is what this is what we experienced in real in real life is it was a dump site but the bones were spread all across these 10 acres and it was a mixture of age classes but ultimately we discovered uh, through the rt quick that there were positive bones on this dump site ultimately that farm was depopulated and there were 13 positive animals that were identified through the usda testing Fast forward to the summer, um, the DNR erected a fence to enclose this dump site to help protect the wild deer from getting into a positive uh, area. And on our side, we did some further investigation. We age classified all the remains as best as we could. Um, but then we also received some funding directly from the state to test the remaining remains and soil from this dump site. After going through the testable parts of the remains, we had about 15 bone and insect samples that were CWD positive. Uh, I say insect samples because as we were investigating these bones, if we open up 
a long bone where the bone marrow is supposed to be, we found maggots and we ultimately tested those. Some were positive and some were not. And again, we found CBD positive samples across all of those age classes. Additionally, we would collect soil samples. So if we found a bone, say we found on the, on the right here, we find this pile of fur and this jaw bone, we'd collect that, but then we'd collect a soil sample underneath it. In our initial investigation of those soil samples, we found multiple soil samples that were positive. So this is a continuing research. This is an area that we hope to have multi-year research. The plan for the fence that the DNR put up is a 20-year plan. So this is a long-term environmental uh, research area for us. We want to understand the extent of contamination inside of out and outside of that fence what's that impact um, for the wild deer and understand the fate of those prions in this environment, in all of those different factors in the environment. So when it comes to environment, what, are the man what is the management implications to that? Well, one piece of it is helping to understand the big picture of transmission. Again, this is not just a, a disease that is an animal problem because the animals are passing it to each other, but they're also depositing those prions into the environment. And that doesn't only affect uh, management of the deer, but it in fact affects the management of the whole environment. Ultimately, it's to reduce the spread of CBD. The more we can learn about it, the more we can reduce that indirect transmission and how those prions move through the environment, through the different factors, the plants, the soil, what about moving forest products? So one of the things on that was interesting to me was on this county property where that fence was erected, it was managed uh, for aspen. And at some point it was going to be harvested for aspen production. Well, in building that fence, they built, or they took down a 120 foot wide corridor to erect that fence and to remove trees from the potential of falling on the fence and taking it down. One thing they decided to do was to, to leave all of those trees on site. Instead of taking the risk of bringing those trees off as a forest product and further spreading CWD prion. So it's, again, it's not just an animal concern, it's a whole environmental concern. And ultimately, research is, is moving to how do we mitigate this in the environment? I talked about that with the soils. We got to continue thinking about. If we find it in the environment, what does that mean for transmission and how do we get rid of it? Again, I'll happy to take any questions or we'll move on to our last topic. Mark, it uh, looks like we got a couple of questions uh, related to transmission to people. Uh, what do we know about the possibility of spreading chronic wasting disease to humans or other, manimal, uh, other mammals such as dogs? Yeah, it's a good question. I, um, I guess purposely didn't put that in here and knew somebody would end up asking the question. Um, one thing, I'll, I'll, I'll hit on other mammals first. Um, it has not been shown to naturally infect other animals, other mammals um, in experimental um, areas. Pigs have been um, orally exposed. So they've, they've fed pigs and a certain percentage of them come down with a neurodegenerative disease. Um, same thing with like cattle, they'll directly put those prions into the cow's brain. It'll cause a neurodegenerative disease. But again, those aren't, those aren't natural um, experiments. What we do know about more natural experiments is that uh, scavengers like coyotes, like wolves, um, the canid family in general is um, we don't, I guess we don't know for sure, but all the evidence that we show is that the canid fam family does not get neurodegenerative diseases. And so we're seeing it pass through them. So that's a concern. Same thing with crows, um, eagles, things like any scavenger, they can move it around, they'll ingest it, it'll, those prions will come out the other end, but it doesn't cause a disease in them. So that, you know, it's, it's a good thing that uh, predators and scavengers like that aren't going to get that neurodegenerative disease, but they do have the potential of spreading those prions 
around the environment. And Humans, Martin, so, sorry. So partly just address this, but uh, next question is what other species are susceptible? Is it only ungulates and, and are all ungulates susceptible? Um, not all ungulates, but all cervids or most cervids. Again, there's certain deer species that have been experimentally infected. Um, I'm thinking like Sitka deer are one, but haven't been shown to be naturally infected. The, the um, cervid species of North America um, are. So all of our, all of our deer, moose, elk, reindeer. Thank you for saying that and not making me reveal that I wasn't sure if moose were cervids. I was going to ask yes. you that uh, just, to, just to be clear. Um, do we know the, how long prions can last in the environment? What we know about prions in the environment is through just a handful of research projects. One of them being a scrapie um, research project. Again, it's not chronic wasting disease, but it's a similar prion disease. Uh, in, that, in that research, um, it was 16 years. So there was a farm, scrapie positive farm. Animals were taken off. 16 years later, they put animals on, sheep on, and they got scrapie. From what we know from chronic waste disease, it's maybe three to five years based off of the research. But those that's limited research, they didn't, they haven't the grand they, right, of researchers haven't let that experiment run out indefinitely. So those were meant to be three to five year research projects. Thank you, Mark. That's, uh, those are all the questions that we have at this point. Okay. So there was, there was some question about hum, humans, I think in your initial question about what's the susceptibility of humans. Um, right. That is uh, that's a really difficult topic. Um, in that, the CDC says don't eat CFD positive deer. There, but there is no direct evidence that CWD has caused neurodegenerative disease in humans. But with that, there is a lot of research looking at that right now. And again, that you know that prion connection that slinky of the misfolded slinky. So this is CWD prion. This is a normal human prion. In a Petri dish, they've made that human prion misfold. Again, that's not a real world scenario. It shows some of the possibility. I know there's a group at Case Western University that is looking deep into this. Um, so I'm just going to say that we don't really know, but ultimately the possibility is there. It's a precautionary principle where we don't know, but nobody wants to push that limit. With that, I'm going to move forward into our last research topic. So a lot of what you know, we do at MinPro is first area of CBD detection. That's a lot of benchtop research ecological impact, that's a lot of field research, but another piece that we work on is human dimensions. Anything with natural resources, we keep understanding that human dimensions is an incredibly important part of research and management. So one thing that we've understood is that it's important that um, this information about CWD and its potential risks, the management, the biology, kind of all what I've been talking to you about reaches all cervid constituents. And I have cervid in, you know, I should have cervid constituents in quotes, because who is that? What, I mean, who, who are those people? Ultimately, it's anybody who cares or deals with cervids. It's hunters, it's managers, it's farmers, it's uh, meat processors. There's a lot of people that are affected by wild and farm cervid uh, businesses. So some of the things that we've been doing over the last two years, in general, it's things like this that I'm doing today. Uh, my colleague up on the right, Dr. Peter Larson, is giving the sl same slinky talk to a, a group um, at Winona State. So before pre-pandemic, we did a lot of in-person events. Since then, we've been doing some, some webinars. Uh, we recently had a paper 
in the wildlife professional that explained a lot of these outreach efforts and kind of our grassroots efforts to get information out to the people of Minnesota. So it, it looks like a broad area of education um, with different pieces of technology that we can see in, in this slide. So generally that's a lot of what we've been doing is just trying to educate um, Minnesota people about chronic wasting disease. But on top of that, uh, we have some specific research projects that are built around human dimensions. Um, and one of those major ones is connecting with underrepresented um, communities in Minnesota, those being the Amish community, which has a, a strong foothold in Southeast Minnesota, where um, CWD has been in the wild for the last six years or so, but also uh, the Twin Cities Monk community, um, who many of them are hunters um, and rely on deer as a source of food, and the tribal nations of, of Minnesota and ultimately um, some in Minnesota and are in Michigan and Wisconsin that we're working with. And so we're trying to understand generally in these communities, what is the knowledge? Um, what is their, what do they understand at a community level about chronic waste and disease? And what are the concerns about chronic waste and disease? In our discussions with uh, the DNR, the Minnesota DNR, a lot of their education efforts are pretty, are broad where it's going out to all the hunters, but we've had these discussions that it's not necessarily getting to some of these specific communities for different reasons. So we're trying to understand where these communities are at in their understanding of chronic waste and disease. Um, with the Hmong and tribal nation, we are having the community members uh, interview other community members so to understand um, what the education needs are needed in these communities. And ultimately that's going to inform outreach material, further educational material about what, what do they, we think they might need to know something, but what do they, what do they really need to know? And what, what matters to them? This is going to include their cultural values and their norms because myself as a deer hunter is different than a tribal hunter in Northern Minnesota. It's, it's a different world. So we're trying to understand that as we develop these educational uh, materials to help in those communities. Additionally, um, there's a tribal hunter survey that we have in 18 tribal nations across those three states. The earlier interviews are more general as we wanna understand from the whole community whether you're a hunter, whether you eat venison, whether you have deer in your uh, garden every day, what does deer mean to you and what is, how does CWD affect that? These hunter surveys are more focused to the hunter and um, it's a quantitative data measurement. Ultimately, that's to inform those tribal natural resource managers on what those hunter surveys feel about hunting activities, what their hunter, hunting activities are, and the potential acceptance of CBD management techniques, getting to the bottom line of a management plan or management plans across these tribal nations, that each, each nation is gonna be slightly different. Can we have a template of management plan that would be accepted across these communities? And then those natural resource managers can use that template to build their management plan on their specific, for their specific tribe. Additionally, we are assisting the tribal nations in Minnesota um, in establishing a CBD surveillance network. And this started last year um, and, in, and moved in through this year and including all of these tribal nations. And um, really they don't have the capacity. Each tribal nation we've understood does not have the capacity to have surveillance or good surveillance on their own. So building this network, so it's shared across these tribal nations to have better surveillance in these areas. And ultimately it's how the question comes down to how will the tribal nations manage CWD if disease is detected on tribal land? So we start building the surveillance network. Some of them are, are, are uh, 
close to areas where we know there's CWD. Some of them are far away, but ultimately none of them have a management plan in place if they have a detection. So it's, it's trying to move all of this forward in these, in these uh, communities, management plan, outreach, and surveillance, so they can get ahead of chronic wasting disease. What are the management implications of that? Essentially, this is for education that leads to more informed stakeholders. Again, our, a big piece of what we started with, with was just educating people. If you, you know, the hope is, right, potentially, that if stakeholders are more educated, they're going to understand the management that goes along with it and why certain things are being done and are gonna be more cooperative with CFD management efforts. In the specific communities, we're trying to build um, recommendations for better outreach and better management plans as we understand uh, what does CBD mean to the people in those communities. So we're gathering the sum summaries of those community perspectives through those interviews, uh, identifying where people are getting their information about CBD, what some of the knowledge gaps are, and how effective the current outreach is so we can make more effective education and outreach. And then that, and that tribal natural, uh, tribal hunter survey is really understanding those hunting activities. What are those tribal hunters doing? What are their perceptions about deer? What are their perceptions about uh, CWD and disease? And help to um, build better management plans in those areas. And that's all I have and we'd be happy to have any further discussion uh, about any of that or anything related to CWD. Mark, thank you. Uh, really covered a lot of ground there with background on the, the disease and its transmission. There's a, a bunch in there that I hadn't heard before. Uptake by plants uh, and, and uh, viability in soil are both concerning and new, at least to me. Um, uh, I am thinking, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So again, I'm going to encourage folks, if you do have other questions to submit those at any time. Um, uh, but I, I guess the big question on my mind, Mark, and you did talk about this at, at some length, but I'm, I'm sure it's on other people's minds too, is just the risk to people as we approach deer hunting season here in Minnesota. Um, and you know, lacking a, a, a very quick, I don't remember the term you said, pen side uh, test, um, difficult to know that. Uh, but you, you have said that although the CDC has recommended against eating known CWD positive um, tissue, um, there's no direct evidence of transmission. And I, I wonder, I'm not sure that you need to repeat it, but I wonder if there's anything you, further you wanna say about that or, or anything, you know, when you're doing these outreach programs and educational programs, um, you mentioned that you're a deer hunter. So I, I, I'm presuming that you would eat venison yourself. Oh, actually, here's a question. Does, does Mark have any concerns about eating venison himself? Are there signs of early CWD that would tip off a hunter to not use a specific deer? So. I'm rambling around a little bit, but anything you want to say about that topic? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Because, um, you know, when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to wild deer and it comes to managing it, ultimately, the managers rely on deer hunters to, to know more about the, um, so, you know, all the surveillance is, is through, well, 99% of the surveillance is through hunting. And so... You know, one, one baseline message is hunters need to keep hunting. There was just a, a paper that just came out that I saw today about the fact, and this is looking at Western populations based out of Colorado, that hunting and keeping populations low reduces CWD. And it, there's been a couple papers coming out of Colorado that's, that have talked about the same thing. Baseline is, Hunters need to keep hunting, and that's only going to help the scenario. Now it's the question of what is the risk to me? Well, me as a hunter, I think about that too. I maybe because I know too much about CWD. But the bottom line is that 
get your deer tested. So there, you know, it depends on where you are in Minnesota, depends on where you are in the country about what that looks like, but whatever the current testing available is, get your deer tested. As a, as a hunter, personally, I won't eat venison unless it's been tested. Do I know based off of the testing that that's 100% accurate? No, it's not. There's going to be some positive deer that are missed. Like I said, you know, many of the deer that are positive that we see look perfectly healthy. And so, um, no, and those tests don't necessarily catch every single one. Like any other diagnostic test, there's a percentage that are going to be missed. But keep hunting, get your deer tested, and then there's practical things to do about um, processing your deer. It's, it's some of the concern about, about uh, having your animals professionally processed and what that looks like, because there is mixture of product and there's not a good way to detect it in a, in a slaughterhouse or a butcher shop. Um, but there, there are things that people can do. It's best if you butcher it yourself at home, but I know not everybody can do that. And then, so there's pieces of that too. So if you do butcher it at home yourself, if you have multiple deer, butcher them individually. Because those tests, it takes, it can take a week or two weeks to get that result back. What you don't want to do is butcher 10 deer, mix everything together and find out one of them was positive, And then you have to throw, you don't have to, you can choose to throw all that venison away because you don't want to consume that. So butchering deer individually, marking what those deer are on those packages. Mark's, Mark's deer, Eli's deer. So if Mark's deer comes back positive and you don't want to consume that, you can get rid of that meat and you still have Eli's deer to eat. Along with that, you know, there's certain measures you can take to um, clean up properly. Uh, recent research has shown that a 50% bleach mixture will destroy prions on stainless steel. That's very specific, right? I mean, 50% bleach on stainless steel, essentially without a lot of organic material. So if it's covered in, in muscle, it's not going to penetrate. But that's a general thing you can do is when you're done clean, when you're done butchering, clean everything up with 50% bleach. That will help the scenario. Wear gloves, things like that. I think it's, there's not a perfect scenario, but there's things you can do to help it make it better. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark, for that. A couple of que several questions coming in, some privately and some uh, publicly. And, and uh, one I think I just addressed, someone asked where and how does one get a deer tested for personal use? And I, I put a link in uh, that I had just searched uh, for CWD testing in Minnesota. It's a DNR, um, Department of Natural Resources link, CWD slash testing. Mark, is that the source, is that the best source for uh, for testing resources or is there a, another it, one? It is. Um, the, the thing about testing in Minnesota is that the Minnesota DNR is only going to pay for testing in certain CWD management zones. So if you're hunting outside a CWD management zone, you can get your deer tested, but you have to go through the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Lab to do so and you have to pay for it yourself. And I think that's explained on that web link that, that you provided, Eli. Okay, great. Again, it's different in every state. If you hunt in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin DNR will test everything across the state if you want it to be. So there's it's differences from state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Great. Uh, next question, if I harvest a deer that looks sickly, what should I do about contacting someone? Uh, also, what about disposing of the carcass if I'm not going to use it? Is that against DNR wanton waste laws? So if, if you harvest a sickly looking deer, um, first thing you should do is contact your local CO. Contact, contact the DNR. Um, from what I understand, and I'm, I'm not representing the DNR, but in conversations, they want, they want those deer. They want to know if that deer is CBD positive as much as you do. It might not be. Chances are, if you see a sickly deer, it's not likely to be CWD. You know, deer are sickly for lots of reasons. But it's that would be the first thing to do is contact the DNR. Uh, from what I understand, if they take your deer, they'll give you a new tag. 
Um, or if, I guess if it, it tests you to be positive, they'll give you a new tag. Again, I don't know all of those details, but then disposal. If you, if, if you just wanna get rid of it, um, the, in CWD management areas, the DNR has dumpsters. So that's the number one best place to put it. They will go to a line landfill, which is a really good way of containing, um, but you can also put it in your regular garbage stream. Uh, put it in garbage bags and put it in your, in your garbage container and that will go to a landfill also. I guess the third option would be to put the carcass back where you found it. So if, if it happens to be CW positive, at least you haven't brought it to a new area. And it's like CWD dumpster, DNR dumpster is way up here. Personal garbage is here. Leaving it on the landscape is way down here that you can't even see, but it's, an, it's better than dumping it in a ditch somewhere and potentially yeah. spreading. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that was a little bit alarmed as you told that story about the uh, the uh, farm in Beltrami County. Um, a question here uh, about how much does deer feeding, which is different from deer farming, but how much does deer feeding contribute to transmission? It's kind of an unknown area about how it actually um, affects transmission. What we do know with deer feeding is that in a CWD positive area, and I talked about that direct transmission, that indirect transmission, if you have a corn pile or a bird feeder and deer keep coming to that same spot, those positive deer are going to be depositing their saliva and their feces in a concentrated spot. You're, just, you're more likely to spread that disease to other deer because you're bringing them together. So it's something that can be controlled. We know that deer are very social animals. They're ultimately gonna be coming together on their own, but that's something that can't be controlled. I, you know, it, it's, it's a management technique that's put into place. How much it actually plays in the transmission, I don't think anybody really knows. Last question that I see at this point is, is this, um, is it possible for other animals, say elk or moose, to get the disease by eating plants that have taken up prions from the soil? To be determined. Re research that needs to be done. So the, the, the research that has been done is, yes, there have been take, prions are taken up by plants. Yes, when fed to these cervidized hamsters, they get neurodegenerative disease. The research hasn't been done to feed them to cervids to see if, if they get disease. And part of that, and a lot of what I talked about is the fact that transmission is um, really depend, dependent on dose. How much prion does it take to cause disease? This is the same thing, whether we're talking deer or the potential for humans. Do I have to take a whole bunch of prions in at once? Is it small amounts of prions over time period? Um, there is some research looking at that. And I guess the, the early answer is that those things are, um, those things matter. So sometimes if it's a small amount of prion over many times over the years, it hasn't caused disease in, in the deer in the research. Um, that's, we're still really early in understanding that transmission based on dose. Great. Uh, just a comment here, great information. Thanks, so many of the private forest management clients we deal with have deer hunting as their top goal for ownership. Is there a one or two page handout, Mark, that we could include, meaning that foresters could include with management plans and, and could pass along to the landowners that they're working with? Um, we have lots of handouts in, in um, MinPro. I guess the question would be what information. I mean, we have very general uh, knowledge, chronic waste and disease handouts that I'd be happy to share. I'll tell you what, Mark, why don't you and I communicate after this event? And uh, I hope I'm not outing him inappropriately, but Tom Kroll is the one uh, asking that question. Tom, if you want to follow up with me, 
um, in response to what Mark just said, if there are particular kinds of information that you think would be most useful, um, let me know. I can work with Mark, and then we can send it uh, to uh, to all of you who registered along with the recording link when we post that. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to thank you all again. I, I do apologize for the, the weird link. I don't know what happened there uh, uh, at the beginning of our presentation. Um, but Mark, I know that put you in a position to have to start uh, in some haste and with some uncertainty, which is not the way you want to start a presentation. Okay. I apologize for that. And also, I know several of you who ended up tuning in had to do that late because of the mixed up link. It worked for me yesterday. I, I don't know what to say about why it didn't work today, but I appreciate your patience and uh, flexibility navigating to that. Uh, this session, as always, has been recorded. Um, I will send, I'll post the recording in the next day or two to our, uh, to the event page, and we'll uh, send that link out to all of you. Um, uh, normally, I would tell you about our November webinar. We had a really great one set up, but we have had to cancel that webinar or at least postpone it um, due to uh, the speaker's availability. Um, so we'll be looking at what we do about that. We may add a new topic or we may take the month of November off. In either case, again, Mark, thank you for your flexibility and for a really very informative presentation. There was a lot of new information there for me and I'm sure for many others as well. Uh, final note, any of you who are interested in continuing education credits, uh, look in the chat. I have posted that link. We do ask you to complete that. Um, definitely by today and the sooner the better uh, for you to fill that out. It's very quick. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that routine. And I think that concludes our presentation. Enjoy the day, everybody. Mark, thank you again. Thanks for having me.